Chapter Thirty Two of Jane Eyre. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. Chapter Thirty Two. I continued the labours of the village school as actively and faithfully as I could. It was truly hard work at first. Some time elapsed before, with all my efforts, I could comprehend my scholars and their nature. Wholly untaught, with faculties quite torpid, they seemed to me hopelessly dull, and at first sight all dull alike. But I soon found I was mistaken. There was a difference amongst them as amongst the educated, and when I got to know them, and they me, this difference rapidly developed itself. Their amazement at me, my language, my rules, and ways, once subsided I found some of these heavy-looking, gaping rustics wake up into sharp-witted girls enough. Many showed themselves obliging, and amiable too, and I discovered amongst them not a few examples of natural politeness, and innate self-respect, as well as of excellent capacity, that won both my good-will and my admiration. These soon took a pleasure in doing their work well, in keeping their persons neat, in learning their tasks regularly, in acquiring quiet and orderly manners. The rapidity of their progress, in some instances, was even surprising, and an honest and happy pride I took in it. Besides, I began personally to like some of the best girls, and they liked me. I had amongst my scholars several farmers' daughters, young women grown almost. These could already read, write, and sew and to them I taught the elements of grammar, geography, history, and the finer kinds of needlework. I found estimable characters among them, characters desirous of information and disposed for improvement, with whom I passed many a pleasant evening hour in their own homes. Their parents, then, the farmer and his wife, loaded me with attentions. There was an enjoyment in accepting their simple kindness, and in repaying it by a consideration, a scrupulous regard to their feelings, to which they were not, perhaps, at all times accustomed, and which both charmed and benefited them, because, while it elevated them in their own eyes, it made them emulous to merit the deferential treatment they received. I felt I became a favourite in the neighbourhood. Whenever I went out, I heard on all sides cordial salutations, and was welcomed with friendly smiles. To live amidst general regard, though it be but the regard of working people, is like sitting in sunshine, calm and sweet, serene inward feelings bud and bloom under the ray. At this period of my life, my heart far oftener swelled with thankfulness than sank with dejection. And yet, reader, to tell you all, in the midst of this calm, this useful existence, after a day passed in honourable exertion amongst my scholars, an evening spent in drawing or reading contentedly alone, I used to rush into strange dreams at night, dreams many-coloured, agitated, full of the ideal, the stirring, the stormy, dreams where, amidst unusual scenes, charged with adventure, with agitating risk and romantic chance, I still again and again met Mr. Rochester, always at some exciting crisis, and then the sense of being in his arms, hearing his voice, meeting his eye, touching his hand and cheek, loving him, being loved by him, the hope of passing a lifetime at his side, would be renewed, with all its first force and fire. Then I awoke. Then I recalled where I was, and how situated. Then I rose up on my curtainless bed, trembling and quivering. And then the still dark night witnessed the convulsion of despair, and heard the burst of passion. By nine o'clock the next morning I was punctually opening the school, tranquil, settled, prepared for the steady duties of the day. Rosamond Oliver kept her word in coming to visit me. Her call at the school was generally made in the course of her morning ride. She would canter up to the door on her pony, followed by a mounted livery servant. Anything more exquisite than her appearance, in her purple habit, with her Amazon's cap of black velvet placed gracefully above the long curls that kissed her cheek and floated to her shoulders, can scarcely be imagined, and it was thus she would enter the rustic building, and glide through the dazzled ranks of the village children. She generally came at the hour when Mr. Rivers was engaged in giving his daily catechizing lesson. Keenly, I fear, did the eye of the visitress pierce the young pastor's heart. A sort of instinct seemed to warn him of her entrance, even when he did not see it, 
and when he was looking quite away from the door, if she appeared at it, his cheek would glow, and his marble-seeming features, though they refused to relax, changed indescribably, and in their very quiescence became expressive of a repressed fervour, stronger than working muscle or darting glance could indicate. Of course, she knew her power. Indeed, he did not, because he could not conceal it from her. In spite of his Christian stoicism, when she went up and addressed him, and smiled gaily, encouragingly, even fondly in his face, his hand would tremble and his eye burn. He seemed to say, with his sad and resolute look, if he did not say it with his lips, "'I love you, and I know you prefer me. It is not despair of success that keeps me dumb. If I offered my heart, I believe you would accept it. But that heart is already laid on a sacred altar, the fire is arranged round it. It will soon be no more than a sacrifice consumed." And then she would pout like a disappointed child. A pensive cloud would soften her radiant vivacity. She would withdraw her hand hastily from his, and turn in transient petulance from his aspect, at once so heroic and so martyr-like. St. John, no doubt, would have given the world to follow, recall, retain her, when she thus left him. But he would not give one chance of heaven, nor relinquished for the Elysium of her love, one hope of the true eternal paradise. Besides, he could not bind all that he had in his nature, the rover, the aspirant, the poet, the priest, in the limits of a single passion. He could not, he would not, renounce his wild field of mission warfare for the parlours and the peace of Vale Hall. I learnt so much from himself in an inroad I once, despite his reserve, had the daring to make on his confidence. Miss Oliver already honoured me with frequent visits to my cottage. I had learnt her whole character, which was without mystery or disguise. She was coquettish, but not heartless, exacting, but not worthlessly selfish. She had been indulged from her birth, but was not absolutely spoiled. She was hasty, but good-humoured, vain, she could not help it, when every glance in the class showed her such a flush of loveliness, but not affected. Liberal-handed, innocent of the pride of wealth, ingenuous, sufficiently intelligent, gay, lively, and unthinking. She was very charming, in short, even to a cool observer of her own sex like me, but she was not profoundly interesting or thoroughly impressive. A very different sort of mind was hers from that, for instance, of the sisters of St. John, Still, I liked her almost as much as I liked my pupil Adele, except that, for a child whom we have watched over and taught, a closer affection is engendered than we can give an equally attractive adult acquaintance. She had taken an amiable caprice to me. She said I was like Mr. Rivers. Only certainly, she allowed, not one-tenth so handsome, though I was a nice neat little soul enough, but he was an angel. I was, however, good, clever, composed, and firm, like him. I was a lucis natare, she affirmed, as a village schoolmistress. She was sure my previous history, if known, would make a delightful romance. One evening, while with her usual childlike activity, and thoughtless yet not offensive inquisitiveness, she was rummaging the cupboard and table-drawer of my little kitchen, she discovered first two French books, a volume of Schiller, a German grammar and dictionary, and then my drawing materials and some sketches including a pencil-head of a pretty little cherub-like girl, one of my scholars, and sundry views from nature, taken in the vale of Morton and on the surrounding moors. She was first transfixed with surprise, and then electrified with delight. Had I done these pictures? Did I know French and German? What a love, what a miracle I was! I drew better than her master in the first school in S. Would I sketch a portrait of her to show to papa? With pleasure, I replied and I felt a thrill of artist delight at the idea of copying from so perfect and radiant a model. She had then on a dark blue silk dress. Her arms and her neck were bare. Her only ornament was the chestnut tresses, which waved over her shoulders with all the wild grace of natural curls. I took a sheet of fine cardboard and drew a careful outline. I promised myself the pleasure of colouring it, and as it was getting late then, I told her she must come and sit another day. She made such a report of me to her father, that Mr. Oliver himself accompanied her next evening, a tall, massive-featured, middle-aged and grey-headed man, at whose side his lovely daughter looked like a bright flower near a hoary turret. He appeared a taciturn, and perhaps a proud personage, but he was very kind to me. The sketch of Rosamond's portrait pleased him highly. He said I must make a finished picture of it. He insisted, too, on my coming the next day to spend the evening at Vale Hall. I went. 
I found it a large, handsome residence, showing abundant evidences of wealth in the proprietor. Rosamond was full of glee and pleasure all the time I stayed. Her father was affable, and when he entered into conversation with me after tea, he expressed in strong terms his approbation of what I had done in Morton School, and said he only feared, from what he saw and heard, I was too good for the place, and would soon quit it for one more suitable. Indeed, cried Rosamond, she is clever enough to be a governess in a high family, papa. I thought I would far rather be where I am than in any high family in the land. Mr. Oliver spoke of Mr. Rivers of the Rivers family, with great respect. He said it was a very old name in that neighbourhood, that the ancestors of the house were wealthy, that all Morton had once belonged to them, that even now he considered the representative of that house might, if he liked, make an alliance with the best. He accounted it a pity that so fine and talented a young man should have formed the design of going out as a missionary. It was quite throwing a valuable life away. It appeared, then, that the father would throw no obstacle in the way of Rosamond's union with St. John. Mr. Oliver evidently regarded the young clergyman's good birth, old name, and sacred profession as sufficient compensation for the want of fortune. It was the 5th of November, and a holiday. My little servant, after helping me to clean my house, was gone, well satisfied with the fee of a penny for her aid. All about me was spotless and bright, scoured floor, polished grate, and well-rubbed chairs. I had also made myself neat, and had now the afternoon before me to spend as I would. The translation of a few pages of German occupied an hour. Then I got my palette and pencils, and fell to the more soothing, because easier occupation, of completing Rosamond Oliver's miniature. The head was finished already. There was but the background to tint, and the drapery to shade off. A touch of carmine, too, to add to the ripe lips. A soft curl here and there to the tresses a deeper tinge to the shadow of the lash under the azured eyelid. I was absorbed in the execution of these nice details, when after one rapid tap, my door unclosed, admitting St. John Rivers. "'I have come to see how you are spending the holiday,' he said. "'Not, I hope, in thought. No, that is well. While you draw, you will not feel lonely. You see, I mistrust you still, though you have borne up wonderfully so far. I have brought you a book for evening solace and he laid on the table a new publication, a poem, one of those genuine productions so often vouchsafed to the fortunate public of those days, the golden age of modern literature. Alas! the readers of our era are less favoured. But courage! I will not pause either to accuse or repine. I know poetry is not dead, nor genius lost, nor has mammon gained power over either to bind or slay. They will both assert their existence, their presence, their liberty and strength again one day. Powerful angels, safe in heaven! They smile when sordid souls triumph, and feeble ones weep over their destruction. Poetry destroyed! Genius banished! No! Mediocrity, no! Do not let envy prompt you to the thought. No, they not only live, but reign and redeem, and without their divine influence spread everywhere, you would be in hell the hell of your own meanness. While I was eagerly glancing at the bright pages of Marmion, for Marmion it was, St. John stooped to examine my drawing. His tall figure sprang erect again with a start. He said nothing. I looked up at him. He shunned my eye. I knew his thoughts well, and could read his heart plainly. At the moment I felt calmer and cooler than he. I had then temporarily the advantage of him, and I conceived an inclination to do him some good if I could. With all his firmness and self-control, thought I, he tasks himself too far, locks every feeling and pang within, expresses, confesses, imparts nothing. I am sure it would benefit him to talk a little about this sweet Rosamond, whom he thinks he ought not to marry. I will make him talk. I said first, Take a chair, Mr. Rivers. But he answered, as he always did, that he could not stay. Very well, I responded mentally. Stand, if you like, but you shall not go just yet. I am determined. Solitude is at least as bad for you as it is for me. I'll try if I cannot deliver the secret spring of your confidence, and find an aperture in that marble breast through which I can shed one drop of the balm of sympathy. Is this portrait like? I asked bluntly. Like? Like whom? I did not observe it closely. You did, Mr. Rivers. He almost started at my sudden and strange abruptness. He looked at me astonished. "'Oh, that is nothing yet,' I muttered within. 
I don't mean to be baffled by a little stiffness on your part. I'm prepared to go to considerable lengths." I continued, "'You observed it closely and distinctly, but I have no objection to your looking at it again.' And I rose and placed it in his hand. "'A well-executed picture,' he said. "'Very soft, clear colouring. Very graceful and correct drawing.' "'Yes, yes, I know all that. But what of the resemblance? Who is it like?' Mastering some hesitation, he answered, "'Miss Oliver, I presume?' "'Of course. And now, sir, to reward you for the accurate guess, I will promise to paint you a careful and faithful duplicate of this very picture, provided you admit that the gift would be acceptable to you. I don't wish to throw away my time and trouble on an offering you would deem worthless.' He continued to gaze at the picture. The longer he looked, the firmer he held it, the more he seemed to covet it. "'It is like,' he murmured. The eye is well managed. The colour, light, expression are perfect. It smiles. Would it comfort, or would it wound you to have a similar painting? Tell me that. When you are at Madagascar, at the Cape, or in India, would it be a consolation to have that memento in your possession? Or would the sight of it bring recollections calculated to enervate and distress? He now furtively raised his eyes. He glanced at me, irresolute, disturbed. He again surveyed the picture. That I should like to have it is certain. Whether it would be judicious or wise is another question. Since I had ascertained that Rosamond really preferred him, and that her father was not likely to oppose the match, I, less exalted in my views than St. John, had been strongly disposed in my own heart to advocate their union. It seemed to me that, should he become the possessor of Mr. Oliver's large fortune, he might do as much good with it, as if he went and laid his genius out to wither, and his strength to waste under a tropical sun. With this persuasion, I now answered, "'As far as I can see, it would be wiser and more judicious if you were to take to yourself the original at once.' By this time he had sat down. He had laid the picture on the table before him, and with his brow supported on both hands, hung fondly over it. I discerned he was now neither angry nor shocked at my audacity. I saw even that to be thus frankly addressed on a subject he had deemed unapproachable, to hear it thus freely handled, was beginning to be felt by him as a new pleasure, an unhoped-for relief. Reserved people often really need the frank discussion of their sentiments and griefs more than the expansive. The sternest seeming stoic is human, after all and to burst with boldness and good will into the silent sea of their souls, is often to confer on them the first of obligations. "'She likes you, I am sure,' said I, as I stood behind his chair, "'and her father respects you. Moreover, she is a sweet girl. Rather thoughtless, but she would have sufficient thought for both yourself and her. You ought to marry her.' "'Does she like me?' he asked. "'Certainly. Better than she likes any one else. She talks of you continually. There is no subject she enjoys so much, or touches upon so often." "'It is very pleasant to hear this,' he said. "'Very. Go on, for another quarter of an hour.' And he actually took out his watch, and laid it upon the table to measure the time. "'But where is the use of going on?' I asked, when you are probably preparing some iron blow of contradiction, or forging a fresh chain to fetter your heart. Don't imagine such hard things. Fancy me yielding and melting, as I am doing. Human love rising like a freshly opened fountain in my mind, and overflowing with sweet inundation all the field I have so carefully, and with such labour prepared, so assiduously sown with the seeds of good intentions, of self-denying plans. And now it is deluged with a nectarous flood, the young germs swamped, delicious poison cankering them. Now I see myself stretched on an ottoman in the drawing-room at Vale Hall, that my bride, Rosamond Oliver's feet. She is talking to me with a sweet voice, gazing down on me with those eyes your skilful hand has copied so well, smiling at me with those coral lips. She is mine. I am hers. This present life and passing world suffice to me. Hush! Say nothing. My heart is full of delight. My senses are entranced. Let the time I marked pass in peace. I humoured him. The watch ticked on. He breathed fast and low. I stood silent. Amidst this hush the quartet sped. He replaced the watch, laid the picture down, rose, and stood on the hearth. "'Now,' said he, "'that little space was given to delirium and delusion. 
I rested my temples on the breast of temptation, and put my neck voluntarily under her yoke of flowers. I tasted her cup. The pillow was burning. There is an asp in the garland. The wine has a bitter taste. Her promises are hollow. Her offers false. I see and know all this." I gazed at him in wonder. "'It is strange,' pursued he, "'that while I love Rosamond Oliver so wildly, with all the intensity indeed of a first passion, the object of which is exquisitely beautiful, graceful, fascinating, I experience at the same time a calm, unwarped consciousness that she would not make me a good wife, that she is not the partner suited to me, that I should discover this within a year after marriage, and that to twelve months' rapture would succeed a lifetime of regret. This I know." "'Strange, indeed!' I could not help ejaculating. "'While something in me,' he went on, "'is acutely sensible to her charms, something else is as deeply impressed with her defects. They are such that she could sympathise in nothing I aspired to, cooperate in nothing I undertook. Rosamond, a sufferer, a labourer, a female apostle? Rosamond, a missionary's wife? No." "'But you need not be a missionary. You might relinquish that scheme." "'Relinquish? What? My vocation? My great work? My foundation laid on earth for a mansion in heaven? My hopes of being numbered in the band who have merged all ambitions in the glorious one of bettering their race, of carrying knowledge into the realms of ignorance, of substituting peace for war, freedom for bondage, religion for superstition, the hope of heaven for the fear of hell. Must I relinquish that? It is dearer than the blood in my veins. It is what I have to look forward to, and to live for." After a considerable pause, I said, "'And Miss Oliver, are her disappointment and sorrow of no interest to you?' "'Miss Oliver is ever surrounded by suitors and flatterers. In less than a month my image will be effaced from her heart. She will forget me, and will marry probably some one who will make her far happier than I should do.' "'You speak coolly enough. But you suffer in the conflict. You are wasting away." No. If I get a little thin, it is with anxiety about my prospects yet unsettled, my departure continually procrastinated. Only this morning I received intelligence that the successor, whose arrival I have been so long expecting, cannot be ready to replace me for three months to come yet, and perhaps the three months may extend to six. You tremble and become flushed whenever Miss Oliver enters the schoolroom. Again the surprised expression crossed his face. He had not imagined that a woman would dare to speak so to a man. For me, I felt at home in this sort of discourse. I could never rest in communication with strong, discreet, and refined minds, whether male or female, till I had passed the outworks of conventional reserve, and crossed the threshold of confidence, and won a place by their heart's very hearthstone. "'You are original,' said he, "'and not timid. There is something brave in your spirit as well as penetrating in your eye. But allow me to assure you that you partially misinterpret my emotions. You think them more profound and potent than they are. You give me a larger allowance of sympathy than I have a just claim to. When I colour, and when I shade before Miss Oliver, I do not pity myself. I scorn the weakness. I know it is ignoble, a mere fever of the flesh. Not, I declare, the convulsion of the soul. That is just as fixed as a rock, firm set in the depths of a restless sea. Know me to be what I am, a cold, hard man." I smiled incredulously. "'You have taken my confidence by storm,' he continued, "'and now it is much at your service. I am simply in my original state, stripped of that blood-bleached robe with which Christianity covers human deformity, a cold, hard, ambitious man. Natural affection only, of all the sentiments, has permanent power over me. Reason and not feeling is my guide, my ambition is unlimited, my desire to rise higher, to do more than others, insatiable. I honour endurance, perseverance, industry, talent, because these are the means by which men achieve great ends and mount to lofty eminence. I watch your career with interest, because I consider you a specimen of a diligent, orderly, energetic woman not because I deeply compassionate what you have gone through, or what you still suffer." "'You would describe yourself as a mere pagan philosopher,' I said. "'No. There is this difference between me and deistic philosophers. I believe, and I believe the gospel. You missed your epithet. 
I am not a pagan, but a Christian philosopher, a follower of the sect of Jesus. As his disciple I adopt his pure, his merciful, his benignant doctrines. I advocate them. I am sworn to spread them. One in youth to religion, she has cultivated my original qualities thus. From the minute germ, natural affection, she has developed the overshadowing tree, philanthropy. From the wild, stringy root of human uprightness, she has reared a due sense of the divine justice. Of the ambition to win power and renown for my wretched self, she has formed the ambition to spread my master's kingdom, to achieve victories for the standard of the cross. So much has religion done for me, turning the original materials to the best account, pruning and training nature. But she could not eradicate nature, nor will it be eradicated till this mortal shall put on immortality." Having said this, he took his hat, which lay on the table beside my pallet. Once more he looked at the portrait. "'She is lovely,' he murmured. "'She is well named the Rose of the World, indeed.' "'And may I not paint one like it for you?' "'Cui bono? No.' He drew over the picture the sheet of thin paper on which I was accustomed to rest my hand in painting, to prevent the cardboard from being sullied. What he suddenly saw on this blank paper, it was impossible for me to tell, but something had caught his eye. He took it up with a snatch, he looked at the edge, then shot a glance at me, inexpressibly peculiar, and quite incomprehensible, a glance that seemed to take and make note of every point in my shape, face, and dress, for it traversed all, quick, keen as lightning. His lips parted as if to speak, but he checked the coming sentence, whatever it was. "'What is the matter?' I asked. "'Nothing in the world,' was the reply and replacing the paper, I saw him dexterously tear a narrow slip from the margin. It disappeared in his glove, and with one hasty nod, and, "'Good afternoon,' he vanished. "'Well!' I exclaimed, using an expression of the district. "'That caps the globe, however!' I, in my turn, scrutinised the paper, but saw nothing on it save a few dingy stains of paint where I had tried the tint in my pencil. I pondered the mystery a minute or two. But finding it insolvable, and being certain it could not be of much moment, I dismissed, and soon forgot it. End of chapter 32